morning and welcome to Cherry Avenue Christian Church Online. It's our hope that we will soon be able to meet in person as a church body. According to the phase one directives, we can now meet as long as we meet certain guidelines, 50% capacity, six feet of so social distancing, and several other things. The elders are gonna to meet tomorrow night and gonna work out the details for us being able to come back together. So look for a letter coming soon that will give you the details of that first Sunday back and exactly when we can come back. And if you haven't signed up to receive the alerts uh, yet, please do so. Just contact Stan with the way you want to be contacted, phone call, email, or text, but we have to have your permission to do so. Now, let's talk about some other things going on weekly here right now. The disciples class is meeting on Zoom at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. You can contact Christy Martin if you would like to join that. The JOY class is meeting on Facebook on Sundays. Contact Nancy Houseman if you are interested in participating. And we also have a men's Bible study on Zoom at 8 a.m. Tuesdays. See Stan if you'd like to participate. On Tuesday, we are also posting my Tuesday morning Bible study on Matthew. If you'd like to participate, all you have to do is join that. And don't forget to check out our word of encouragement on Wednesdays. And for those of you who don't feel safe coming out, I want to remind you and affirm to you that we will still continue to post our Sunday messages online even after we start coming back here uh, in the building. Now, <clears throat> we don't have connect cards, but I'm gonna ask you to let us know that you watched, the, watched this uh, message this morning by checking uh, either a comment in the comment section or put a like on Facebook. Give us a call, email us, let us know that you participated. We would really appreciate that. For our prayer list this morning, please keep Bing B in your prayer. He has cancer. Merle B is at home and improving. Howard C, Judy W has asked us to pray for him. Melanie, Valerie M's niece, now she's doing a lot better, but please keep her in your prayers. Arlene P is now at home and improving. Joanne S is also improving. Andrew W, this is John L's grandson. He was in a bad motorcycle accident and he is at UVA. Please keep him and John in your prayers. And we also have a praise today. Saturday, the 16th, was Tommy and Pat Durr's 50th wedding anniversary. Congratulations, Tommy and Pat, for 50 great years. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I do come to you and I thank you, Father, for the day. And I thank you that, that some of the, these restrictions are being lifted. <clears throat> and we're going to be able to come back and to meet together in person and have that sweet fellowship that we have in you, that we have together. We ask you to be with those that uh, need your help now physically, Bing B, Merle B, Howard C, Melanie, Arlene P, Joanne S, Andrew W. I just pray, Father, that you would be with them and Give them, Father, your blessing and healing at this time. Ask you to be with us as uh, this presentation is made. And I pray that your spirit would go out from that and into the homes and into the hearts of the people listening. And I pray that, uh, that great things might be done, that we might be uplifted, we might be encouraged, we might find, Father, the enthusiasm to take your message, the message of the gospel to others. For Father, we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Today, we are in week five of our series, Stay Positive. And Stan is gonna be talking about keep your enthusiasm. I've noticed that positive people generally have a kind of a spring in their step. And as Christians, we certainly have a lot to be enthusiastic about. I mean, we have a great church family. We have a God who loves us and cares for us and answers prayer. And perhaps the best thing we have to be thankful for is the fact that through Jesus Christ, God has cleansed us of our sins. David wrote in Psalm 51 verses seven and eight, purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me, 
Now, let me rejoice. That's truly something to be enthusiastic about. Listen as our, our band plays this song. Make me broken so I can be healed. I'm so callous now I can't feel. I want to run to you with heart wide open. Make me broken. Make me empty so I can be filled. I'm still holding on to my will and I'm completed when you are with me make me empty till you are my one desire till you are my one true Make me lonely so I can be yours. Till I want no one more than you, Lord. In the darkness, I know you will hold me. Make me lonely. What kind of things do you get enthusiastic about? A lot of you I know get excited over how your sports teams do when they do well, especially UVA. Now that live sports are on hold, ESPN and the ACC Network have shown a lot of quote unquote classic games, including UVA baseball's 2015 national championship game. And a lot of people have actually organized watch parties to watch a game that happened five years ago. That's enthusiasm. We get enthusiastic when our sports teams are doing well. We get enthusiastic when our investments are going up, at least back when they were going up. We get excited when the kids or grandkids do something. In fact, grandkids are about the only things we get excited about no matter what. Over the last couple of Christmases, my brother's grandkids have helped their great grandma decorate the tree. And ornament after ornament has been dropped on the floor and busted. And great grandma kept saying, come on over here, honey, here's another one, put this one on the tree. The grandkids and great grandkids are the exception. But so many of the things that we get enthusiastic about are dependent on our circumstances. If your job's doing well, you're enthusiastic. If our finances are doing well, we're enthusiastic. If business is good, we're enthusiastic. But that enthusiasm tends to wane when we hit a rough patch like the one that we're going through right now. And I understand why that is. Some of you have been laid off or you've been furloughed from your job. Some of you have had your business suffer because of all the shutdowns. Some of you have family members you haven't been able to visit because of the lockdowns. Some of you have been stuck in the house for two months with people you love, but 
you're starting to wear on each other. And enthusiasm can be hard to come by. Well, we're in the fifth week of our series, Stay Positive. And today we want to talk about enthusiasm. And we need to start this with a disclaimer, okay? When I talk about enthusiasm, I'm not saying we, you, that you have to have a tr personality transplant. I mean, I mean, at least not most people. If you're just a cranky, chronic whiner and complainer, then yeah, okay, you could use one. But I'm not saying you have to be one of those naturally perky, excitedly happy people all the time. It, you know, like morning people. Always getting up early and in your face, good morning, rise and shine, the sun's up, the birds are singing, it's a beautiful day. John Branion said he asked his wife, who's a morning person, how do you know those birds are singing? That's the only sound they know how to make. It might be that all the rest of them are yelling at the one bird who got up early and woke the rest of them up. Maybe you've been there and you understand that. I'm not saying you have to pretend that hurtful things don't hurt, or that bad days aren't bad, or that pain somehow feels good. That's not what we're talking about. In fact, before we talk about what godly enthusiasm is, we need to be sure to understand what it isn't. Let me tell you what biblical enthusiasm isn't. Biblical enthusiasm isn't ignoring the pain. Enthusiasm isn't just skipping along, la 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 la, as if nothing's wrong, and ignoring the pain. It's not acting as if you don't have any problems. It's not pretending that nothing's wrong when there is something wrong. Enthusiasm isn't being in denial. Enthusiasm isn't pretending that everything is going great when it's not. The word enthusiasm actually comes from two Greek words, entheos, meaning in, en meaning in, and theos meaning God. So enthusiasm literally means in God or filled with God. Enthusiasm is born out of an intimacy with God. It isn't just a mood, it's a spiritual result of an intimate relationship with God. Biblical enthusiasm is keeping yourself in God's will so that you'll have the perspective and the focus to see the big picture and to carry out your mission. It's growing so close to God that you begin to see things the way God sees things, which lets you focus on the mission that He put you here to accomplish. And what it does is it produces a positive attitude. Not because we don't have problems, but because we've drawn so close to Christ that we have the perspective and the focus to see beyond just our temporary problems so that we can carry out the mission God put us here to fulfill. Then we have the perspective to see them as the light and momentary troubles that they are, as Paul described them in 2 Corinthians 4. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians he lists the things he's been through in 2 Corinthians 11. He said this, he said, I've been whipped times without number and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders have given me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. I've traveled on many long journeys. I've faced danger from rivers and robbers. I face danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I face danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. I face danger from men who claim to be believers and are not. I've worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty, and I've gone without food. I've shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then, besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches." I'm exhausted just going through that list. And there's nothing that I've gone through that's like that. And if Paul were just forced, or just focused on his circumstances, if he weren't growing closer to Christ every day, then he would have given up long before this. I don't know about you, but I don't think a lot of people would have made it past the second beating of 39 lashes with a leather strap and stayed very faithful. But he didn't just survive all of that, he thrived in the process. He started a number of churches along the way as he traveled, and he helped them grow, spreading the gospel all over the world at that time. And look at how he viewed the situation. The book of Philippians is a letter he wrote to the first church he started in Eastern Europe. 
five to six after five to six years after he wrote the letter to Corinth that we just read from, uh, he wrote this letter and talked about all that he had been through. And he's sitting in prison. Listen to what he writes. In Philippians 1, he writes, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Now, notice his enthusiasm and his perspective here. He's able to see how the harsh things that he's been through have actually helped the gospel spread. And even now, as he's sitting in prison, he says, These guards thought I was chained to them, but the truth is, they're chained to me. And Paul took advantage of this situation as they were with him for hours every day, and he shared the gospel with them. And here's the ripple effect. His ability to stay enthusiastic, to keep his perspective on his situation and stay focused on his mission. Verse 14 says, caused other people to grow confident and more daring about sharing the gospel without fear. That's what enthusiasm does. It gives you the ability not to ignore your circumstances or pretend they're not bad, but to remember that God is always there to walk you through them. And to look at what opportunities might exist in those circumstances that might never have existed if things were going smoothly. Uh, We've hated not being able to meet together over the past couple of months. But this crisis has given us an opportunity to reach out with the gospel in new ways. With these videos on Facebook and YouTube, we've learned that they've reached a number of people we hadn't had a connection with before. The closer we walk with Christ the more we begin to look at the world through His eyes and to see things with His perspective. And the more we'll focus on the mission that He put us here to complete. Ephesians 2.10 says this, it says, We are His masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do the work He planned for us long ago. In other words, God put you here for a reason. You have the gifts and abilities you have for a reason. You have the interests and passions that you have for a reason. You have the experiences God has allowed you to go through so that you would be equipped to accomplish important things for His kingdom. And the closer you walk with Christ, the more you're able to stay focused on your mission regardless of your circumstances. And that produces a positive outlook. In verse 16 of Philippians 1, Paul said, I am put here for the defense of the gospel. He didn't lose sight of what he was put here to do. I mean, it would have been easy to say, man, I I was put here to spread the gospel. I'm a church planter. How am I supposed to do that sitting in prison? I don't get it, God. But instead, he focused on the literally captive audience that he had. Men who weren't just rank and file guards. These guards went on following their service in that position to become influential men in Rome. They were movers and shakers. And Paul saw the opportunity God had given him to lead these influential men to Christ. He's still enthusiastic about his mission because he's close to God. He sees the big picture and he's focused on his mission. In fact, look at how he views even the positive things in his life. In chapter 3 of Philippians, he's gone through and listed a number of the advantages advantages he's had in life and all the credentials he's earned in, in their society. And listen to how he views them starting in verse 7. He says, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of His resurrection and participation in His sufferings becoming like Him in death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Think of the things in your life that you're proud of, your accomplishments, the the things you've earned, maybe your degree or, or your job or a position that you've attained or a business you've established, and you've worked hard for that. And to say you consider them all garbage compared to knowing Christ. Now, the Greek word for, that's translated garbage in this passage 
is the word scubula. I, I, I love to say that. Uh, although, to be honest, it's not really a church word. John Ortberg points out that this translation of scubula as garbage or, or, or rubbish is a very kind translation. Now, other translations have this as dung or excrement, and even that, it, it's closer to accurate, but they're still kind translations. The word Paul uses here is a pretty strong word. I mean, he's passionately trying to communicate to people how he considers these things. So, this isn't really a church word, not necessarily profanity level, but kind of crude, something you would turn your nose up at. That's the word Paul uses. He says that everything that people usually consider valuable and desirable in this life, to him they're like manure compared to walking close to Christ. So it's not just that other things aren't worthwhile to him anymore, but they're actually detestable by comparison. That's perspective. That's recognizing that those things, just like our current circumstances, are temporary and they're worthless compared to growing close to Christ and considering eternal life in heaven. And he can face the difficulties he's been through along with his current state in prison because of this perspective and this focus. He reminds us a few verses later, starting in verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Philippi was a Roman colony that had a lot of retired Roman soldiers living in it, and it was known for patriotic nationalism. And he says, look, keep your perspective. Remember that you're not really citizens of Rome. You're long-term residents of Rome. Your citizenship is in heaven. It's like saying to us, remember, you're not really citizens of the U.S., you're long-term residents there. Your real citizenship is in heaven. And it's going to outlast the U.S. or any other nation by forever, literally. So keep your enthusiasm. Help it grow. Stay close to God. Stay in Him. Not only will it help you deal with this crisis, but any difficulty you face. And it has an impact on others. When they see enthusiasm and positive outlook in your life in the midst of a crisis, you're going to have opportunities to accomplish your mission and build His kingdom that you wouldn't have otherwise. And so I want to give you a couple of action steps. Some things that you can do that will help you keep your enthusiasm and grow it, no matter what your circumstances. One is you need to do everything you can to walk closely with Christ. Read, pray, study in groups and classes. Make your quiet time a priority. A number of you have more time on your hands than you had before. Spend some of that time reading God's Word and praying. Stay involved with Bible studies. Even with our social distancing right now, we have an online Bible study every Tuesday uh, and a Bible school class and a men's Bible study meeting on Zoom each week. And the JLY class is meeting on Facebook. Make sure that you continue to study and grow in your faith. The more you're reminded of God's goodness and the promises He's made to you, the more enthusiastic you'll grow. Another thing that's important is to ask God to help you see things from His perspective. This is part of that renewing of your mind that Romans 12, 2 talks about. We try to look at things from His perspective, not ours. That helps us to see the difficult things for what they are and helps us celebrate the most important thing, people coming into relationship with Him. Be proactive in trying to look for an opportunity in all circumstances. I've known people who were in the hospital or rehab centers or who took the opportunity to be an influence for Christ with the doctors and nurses and the food service workers there. There are people who've been furloughed or laid off from where they're working and have used some of their additional time to serve other people. I know people from our church have spent time calling and checking on and talking with those who can't get out right now. Some people have offered jobs to those who might be out of work to give them a chance to, to compensate for that lost time and those lost wages. Think about how your attitude affects the people you interact with. When they see you staying positive, even in the midst of turmoil, you never know what opportunities you'll have to explain how it is that you can have that attitude. And it affects the attitude of those people around you. 
When you're positive, when you're enthusiastic, it, it has a positive influence on others. I've shared with a few of you before about a time I went with my nephew to a department store at a mall. It was the morning after Christmas and he needed to return something. And as you can imagine, it was busy in the store. There was a line at, at the cashier desks. And there were two sales clerks there. One of them finished with one customer and he clapped his hands and he said, all right, let's have some fun. And the next customer smiled and she wanted to return a purse. And he took the purse and he held it up to his shirt and he said, I, I can't use this. It doesn't go with my outfit. And the customers laughed and the other cashier laughed. And it helped us to have a better mood in what's usually a tedious and frustrating situation. And when you have perspective, when you begin to see things from God's point of view, you see things and you see people in their proper place. We look for opportunities in every situation and we recognize how we can influence other people. A third thing that's important is to focus on your mission. You know, focusing on your mission, glorifying God and helping others find Him, it helps you to keep from getting dragged down by your circumstances. You see things like your job and your hobbies as a means to an end, not as an end in and of themselves. And that way, when things aren't going well in those areas, you don't get dragged down by your circumstances because you're focused on your real mission, your real purpose in life. When we're walking with God, we have purpose that makes us enthusiastic because it's a greater purpose than anything we could ever come up with. It's greater than your hobbies, it's greater than your job, and it's something God can help you fulfill regardless of what point you're at in life. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. The main thing in your life is glorifying God and building His kingdom. That's your purpose. Our job, our hobbies, our interests, our relationships are about accomplishing that purpose. And when we're focused on that, it helps us to be enthusiastic and keep a positive attitude regardless of our current circumstances. Paul didn't let being in jail keep him from accomplishing his purpose. He had to change the way he went about it. He was isolated from a lot of the people he was trying to help because he was in prison. You might say he was practicing forced social distancing. So, he continued to teach them through letters. It reminds me a lot of what we've had to do in adjusting to preaching and teaching on video since we couldn't meet in person, or having Bible school classes and celebrate recovery groups on Zoom. Paul couldn't travel to preach and teach, so he wrote letters. And not only did those letters help the Christians he wrote to, but they became a large part of our New Testament. And now they've helped people for over 2,000 years. And they might never have been written if God hadn't allowed him to have his routine disrupted. And if his circumstances hadn't forced him to be confined to a cell where he had to look for some other way to accomplish his mission. And when you keep your focus on accomplishing what God put you here to do, every job you work is important. Every setback has an opportunity. Every difficulty presents new ways for you to accomplish what God put you here to do. And, and that keeps you enthusiastic. In Colossians 3, starting with verse 23, which Paul wrote about the same time as he wrote his letter to, uh, to the Philippians, it says this, Whatever you do, whether you're the President of the United States, a company executive, a landscaper, a nurse, a fast food worker, a teacher, a cashier, a salesperson, whatever, whether you're paid or you're a volunteer, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as if working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you're serving. Another translation puts it this way. It says, whatever you do, do it enthusiastically as something done for the Lord, not for men, knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. That's mission focus. That's enthusiasm. When you realize whatever you're doing, you're doing it for the Lord. If you're doing custodial work, you're cleaning for the Lord. If you're caring for patients, you're treating them for the Lord. If you're cooking for customers, you're cooking for the Lord. If you're running a business, you're doing that for the Lord. If you're a Christian, 
everything you do is God's work. And that gives you a new perspective, even in a job that may not be what you would want to do for the rest of your life, because your real work is bringing glory to God and growing his kingdom. Making money, working your way up the ladder, establishing a business, those are all ancillary benefits. Your real work is glorifying God, and that gives you the enthusiasm to do your work the very best that you possibly can. You be the best dishwasher who ever picked up a plate. You be the best customer service rep who ever solved a problem. You be the best truck driver who ever got behind the wheel because you're working for God. We need to understand that enthusiasm isn't so much a product of the environment as much as it is a posture of our hearts. I'm doing this for the Lord in a world that's rampant with negativity. We're going to stay positive, not in denial, not ignoring the trouble and the hard times, but walking with Christ in such a way that we see those circumstances through His eyes and we keep focused on the vital mission that He put us here to accomplish. Listen, if the Son of God died for our sins, then our only reasonable response is to give our whole lives back to Him. That's why we work enthusiastically, not for ourselves. We do it for the Lord. Whatever you do, Whatever you do, wherever you are, whatever your agenda, work at it with all your heart to glorify God in all you do. Because there are two types of people in the world. There are those who let their environment influence their enthusiasm, and there are those who let their enthusiasm influence their environment. And look, when people see enthusiasm in us, a positive outlook despite the circumstances, when they see us giving our best effort in situations where most people would just mail it in, it gives more of an opportunity to advance the gospel. Paul was chained to Roman guards, but it's probably more accurate to say that they were chained to him. And he had an influence through all those difficulties because of his ability to stay in theos, enthusiastic, in God, filled with God in his will so that he could have the perspective to be able to focus on the big picture and his mission despite his circumstances. At the end of the letter, he says this in verse 22, all the saints greet you, but especially those from Caesar's household. Here he was in prison and he influenced the household of an emperor. That's what God can do when we keep our enthusiasm, when we stay in him, filled with him, when we draw close to Him, when we learn to view things from His perspective, and we keep laser-focused on our mission. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank You for the fact that Jesus loved us enough to come here to earth to give His life for us. And Lord, if He was willing to do that, the best thing that we can do in return the minimum that we should be doing in return is giving our whole life to Him. And I pray, Lord, that You would help us to stay in You, to to build that enthusiasm and help us to, to draw close to You so that we can keep the perspective we need to see the big picture and stay focused on our mission so that we can carry out that mission You've put us here to accomplish and develop that enthusiasm within us. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. At the traditional Passover meal shared by Jesus and his disciples, there were four cups of wine that were offered to commemorate God's fourfold promise to Israel in Exodus 6, 6 through 7. The promise of relief, release, redemption, and relationship. That is, relief from the burdens imposed by the Egyptians, release from the bondage of slavery, and redemption through His great great acts and power. Finally, God would seek a relationship with His people He called His own. It is thought that at the Last Supper, the cup that was offered by Jesus first is the third cup, often referred to as the cup of blessings. It is through the death of Jesus Christ that we are given the blessing of not only salvation, but the promised abundant life. Think on these things as we listen to our choir sing, Fill My Cup, Lord.
Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, Luke records for us, Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Then he said, take this and share it among yourselves. Now that's the cup of blessing we talked about earlier. He says, for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. And he took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it into pieces and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread at this time and eat that together. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> After supper, he took another cup of wine. This is the relational cup. And he said to them, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Let's partake of that cup together. Let's pray. Dear Father, as we are here today and we are partaking of the cup, we partake in the bread. We ask you, Father, to fill us not only with blessings, but fill and fulfill our relationship with you as we, as we are drawn closer and closer to you. Thank you so much for the forgiveness of sins that we have received because you gave your son for us. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. I want to thank you all for being a part of our service today. I want to thank you for sharing your gifts and your offerings with us. So let's go forth this week and be enthusiastic.